So hit it. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of This is the Play Sports, the podcast. We're excited. We've got a couple of great guests tonight, uh, or this morning, I guess we should say. Uh, We got my friend Tyson Ewing, who is the broadcast statistician, statistician, it's a hard word to say, for the Utah Jazz TV broadcasts. He's also the voice of the Utah women's basketball team on ESPN 700 radio. Uh, so that's my introduction for my friend. Uh, why don't you introduce uh, your pal, Dad? Well, my friend is Mike Sorensen. We were colleagues together at a Salt Lake City newspaper for years and years and years. And uh, he's a good friend, and uh, we appreciate both these guys joining us. Thanks again. Good to be here. Excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, well, we start, We have our format of four quarters we discussed. The first quarter we discussed this professional basketball team that's doing pretty well. Tyson, what's going on with these guys? Why are they so good? The Utah, oh, I, that's who, that's I, t- <laughs> I tell you what, they are fantastic right now. They're in a complete groove. Uh, statistically, they are about as good as you can possibly get. Uh, but really right now, the reason that, at least in my opinion, that they're doing so exceptionally well is they're playing some great team defense and they're shooting a heck of a lot of threes and it's resulted in a lot of wins, 11 straight wins now. You know, Mike's a big ABA fan like I am. It's nice to see the three-pointers uh, being launched. Uh, bring back some memories of the Utah Stars. Yeah, they don't have that siren anymore, but uh, they're shooting about 10 times as many as they used to back in those ABA days, that's for sure. Did they play a siren during the games when, when they when would Glenn make a Glenn Thompson did a three-pointer, yeah. Yeah, they turned that siren on. Every time a three-pointer would be made, that's true. I imagine that would be quite loud or – I guess I don't. Know, I I really wish there were fans at Vivint Arena now to enjoy what was going on, what's going on right now with the Jazz because I think they would just be elated and through the roof. I mean Tyson. I mean I was looking at the shot chart for the Jazz game when they blew out the Warriors completely, just cleaned them off the floor. And the interesting thing to me was like the Jazz didn't take a single mid-range shot in that game. Is that an anomaly? Is that just the way that they want to play ball, or what's going on there? Well, Austin, you know about as well as anybody that David Locke is all about the using using the paint and shooting those three pointers, and that's exactly uh, exactly the direction that this team's gone. Quinn Snyder uh, is all about trying to get the easy points in the paint. Obviously, the lobs, Rudy Gobert, um, and just throwing up nothing but three pointers. I mean, they 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 now lead the league in three pointers made. Uh, they've also led the league in three pointers taken this year. So they're absolutely focusing on on taking the three, on getting the ball in the paint. And play from that mid-range game. You know, I think as much as anything, uh, uh, is their experience they have this year on the team. You know, I've covered them the last decade or so, and I did it quite regularly back in four, three or four years ago. And, um you know, this year they have basically this. Year. The thing is, they're they're a year older and they're a year more together. So guys like Mike Conley, he had a rough time at the start last year. He's doing a lot better. Bogdanovich is maybe not playing quite as well, but he's get, he's in the groove. And just having that, uh, and Clarkson's in his second year. So I think it's just a matter of being together an extra year has made a huge difference. And then just uh, you know, guys like you know Mitchell and Gobert have been around for a few years together, and Ingles. So it's just a great uh, chemistry. Another thing that these guys are. They're all really good guys, you know. I mean, if you guys have um, – Tyson, you might have been in the locker room before, but they're – you know, these guys are good guys, you know, and they're not uh, – there's no real jerks on the team. Like, you know, they've never had very many, but they've had a couple over the years. And they brought back Derek Favors this year. He's a great guy, and I think he's added to the mix. So I think the chemistry has made a difference because a lot of teams might have more talent than the Jazz. They just seem to work together a lot better. Yeah, I think one thing – that's uh, Tyson touched on this. Like the big story for the Jazz right now is they're the they're the best shooting team in the NBA by far, and I think something that's getting lost in the in that whole excitement is just the impact that Rudy Gobert is having on the rest of the team's ability to to take open shots. What can you say about that, Tyson? Do you think do you, what is Rudy Gobert doing offensively for the Jazz? Well, there's 
there's that's a perfect example. These last two games have been a perfect example of why it's so difficult to defend the Jazz. Because, as you just mentioned, they're one of the best three-point shooting teams. In fact, the best shooting team in the NBA, as you alluded to. People are just forgetting about Rudy Gobert. Now, Rudy Gobert is right now the best screener in the NBA. Uh, we always hear about the term assists, but if you watch the game, which I know you guys do, you see how much movement Rudy Gobert is doing. He's on the floor. He's doing nothing but setting screens, whether it's on the ball, whether it's off the ball. He wants nothing more than to get his teammates open. What he does so well, the thing that nobody really talks about about Rudy Gobert that he does so well is he rolls to the rim. Uh, he, he's definitely not the Carl Malone roller, but what he does do is because of his length, he's able to roll to the rim. And you know, players like Mike Conley that Mike was just touching on, uh, players like Mike Conley has had this offseason and this last past season uh, to get to work with Rudy Gobert and figure out that chemistry as, uh, like I said, like Mike was just talking about, that Conley has actually been able to develop that chemistry with Rudy Gobert. So Rudy Gobert's presence on the floor, uh, you know, definitely goes understated so often because People just want to look at the fact that he can't do your typical post-up moves, which, frankly, we all know he can't. It's, 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 it's kind of embarrassing at times when he does do those <laughs> post-up moves because he can't do them. Um, but what he does do so exceptionally well is he sets screens and he can figure out ways to get open by rolling to the rim. And that opens up, up the outside, which is why you see four shooter on the floor plus Rudy Gobert. It makes it so difficult for the Jets to defend – that first game against Dallas, <laughs> Rudy Gobert had his second highest scoring output of his career with 29 points. That's because Dallas put so much of an emphasis <laughs> on guarding those three-pointers because that's what Utah does so well. And so Rudy was able to just have a heyday. It was also as, uh, the most field goal attempts he's ever taken in a game as well by far. I think it was about five, field, five more attempts than, he, uh, than he's ever taken. But that's because Dallas took away the three-pointer, but really they didn't. <laughs> Tyson, you're a you're a stats wizard, okay? You're you're you know what you're talking about, all right? So let's let's move on to the next quarter. I want to talk about another guy who's a big part of the Jazz equation who deserves a lot of credit. I think Tim McMahon from ESPN. I hope I said his name right. Uh, said that uh, he thinks Quinn Snyder could be a front runner for Coach of the Year. Sorny, what's what's your take on that? You know, I think he has a, a chance, but I, I'm going to say right now that unless they have the best record in the league, he may, he may not get it because if you look back, the way they, this award works, and it's not that big of a deal, I don't think. Um, if you're a good team and you just get a little better, or, you know, each year, then you're not going to win the award. Look at Jerry Sloan. He never won it all those years. Um, usually it's a guy that has a, takes over a losing team, and all of a sudden they're a winning team, and they're going to go was, wow, that turned them around. But if you just get 10 more wins than you got last year, you'll say, well, they were already pretty good. So uh, I think, you know, he's definitely doing a great coaching job. But the thing is, he's um, – whether he's going to get it, it just depends on if, – if they have the best record in the league and they kind of blow everyone away, they're going to – I think he certainly should get it and will get it. But if they're just going to be one of the top three or four, you know, they were fourth or fifth the last couple of years, he probably will not get it. But even he's doing a great coaching job nevertheless. I mean, it's been a long time since the Jazz have won that award. Frank Layden, I think, in the 80s was the last time. And Jerry Sloan uh, got robbed a few times. Uh, the one that comes to mind is Hubie Brown winning it for Memphis one year when they had a slew of first-round draft picks and high lottery picks. And, Crud, you get four or five of those guys, you should have a good record. But Jerry Sloan did it with the same guys, you know, just pounding each year and, and moving on as they grew older. So, I give Snyder a lot of credit for in this time of analytics that he looked at the three point shot and said, you know, if we can do this right, that's an extra point on every possession. If you think about it, and if you can convert on 40% of those, those are, those are some valuable points that make close games uh, sway in your favor a little bit. Uh, I don't know what you think, Tyson. Do you think that that analyzing the three pointer has been the key to the uh, success so far? Oh, absolutely. A thousand percent. Quinn Snyder realized, I mean, you saw it last year, they were setting all sorts of records as far as team records goes um, just a season ago. But this year there was an actual point of emphasis made on, you know, taking good looks. And you'll notice that so often 
a, a good shot that sticks out in my opinion, or a bad shot, you might say, uh, was Jordan Clarkson's quick trigger yesterday when he was bringing it up the floor and he quickly pulled up within four, uh, four or five seconds of the shot clock. He knocked it down, might not be considered a good shot back in the olden days, but those are the shots that Quinn Snyder wants this team to take. And, you know, he's, he's, he's absolutely adapted to the new way of basketball and his team, even though, you know, you think about this team for a moment, you know, Bo, uh, Boyan might be considered the best three point shooter on the team. And he's having a bad season. Technically yesterday was his best good three point shooting game of the year. Uh, but if you're going to say that their best three point shooter, Boyan Bogdanovich isn't shooting very well, and they're still shooting the way that they are, then this team is absolutely scary uh, for what could happen still. So yes, I would absolutely say that, that, that they focus so much and so highly on that three pointer. And that's the reason that we're seeing so much success right now. I was just going to add one thing about, you know, Snyder, you know, I used to, you know, travel with the jazz quite a bit. And so sometimes I get to talk to him one-on-one -on -one and I was doing a story on three point shooting about four or five years ago. And that's from before the jazz, they were a defensive team and they were kind of, you know, actually they were kind of a boring team back then. You know, they, were, they led the league in defense. They didn't score very much. And I remember saying, what about the three-point shot, Quinn? And he said, well, you know, I like the open shots, but he, he said, I don't know if I like it when guys step back behind the three-point line. And now you look at that, and they do it like five times a game. I mean, everybody, Clarkson and Boyan, all these guys, they, they step back behind the line to shoot it, and that's their strategy, and it's worked. And, you know, I think it's give credit to the Jazz for taking advantage of it. Yeah, I think they've definitely figured out that that long two is a shot they really want to avoid, and they're, they're not taking it, and they're reaping the benefits for it. So let's move on to quarter three. We're going to switch over to college basketball here. Tyson, uh, we're not going to talk about the women's basketball uh, this episode. We'll get you on another episode. We're going to talk about men's hoops, okay? So, maybe, Dad, can you fill us in on what's been going on with, uh, with the, the men's basketball scene here in Utah? Well, it's one of those years where – conceivably the state of Utah could be shut out of the NCAA tournament. I mean, BYU and Utah state showing some promise, but they've stubbed their toe a little bit recently. When I asked our guests, Mike, uh, can we go a year without anybody going to the NCAA tournament? You know, I, I really doubt it. I think BYU is, is pretty much uh, get, not a shoe in, but I think they're going to make it. You know, I'm, I'm quite familiar, even though I didn't cover BYU, I've done the, preview for Street and Smith for the last few years on the WCC and they were expected to have a pretty good year but it's turned out they've kind of had just an average one and uh, BYU is definitely one of the two best teams along with Gonzaga. St. Mary's is down, San Francisco's pretty good, Pepperdine's decent, the rest of the league's pretty bad so uh, BYU's already lost to Gonzaga, they lost, they split with Pepperdine, uh, the rest of the schedule you know if they just win They'll probably lose to Gonzaga again, but if they can win like all but one of those games, they'll be 21 and six. And right now, I think Joel Lenardi has them as a number nine seed. So they're not, uh, unless they just go in the, in the tank, I would bet that they're going to be in the tournament this year. So BYU, I think will be Utah State's on the border. Uh, they're kind of like a bubble team and they've got to win, beat Boise State once or twice coming in to, to get, probably get in. But I think BYU will make it. Yeah, you know, I, I Losing to Pepperdine was a little disappointing, obviously, for BYU. But, like you said, they are the second-best team in the West Coast Conference, and that should mean something. Uh, you got, you're up at the U or around the Utes a little bit. Uh, what do you think's going on with the Utes? And then if you'd address the Utah State and BYU situations, too. Uh, well, first of all, the one thing I can speak of from experience just being – uh, not necessarily by the team this year, as the women's team, as Austin alluded to, but uh, but being able to be a part of it in some way, shape, or form is that this is just a strange, really, really strange year for everybody. I mean, we all know how weird it is, um, but having an opportunity of being able to speak to student athletes on a regular basis, I know full well that these guys are going through just some just just strange times and trying to figure out exactly how to piece together good basketball games without your regular uh, practice schedule, uh, without your regular, you know, preseason or off-season workouts. Everything was just strange. And so this whole season has kind of just been um, weird overall. Um, I mean, it, it's, it's looking over the schedule for Utah. 
it's disappointing the way that they're performing. Uh, they're as as I'm sure you can see, they're really inconsistent, and they they just cannot seem to find uh, a really a true sense of staying together. And so uh, I don't know if that's going to speak too much about just how strange the season is. I mean, you can use that as excuse all you want, um, but. Uh, as far as Utah goes, I mean, obviously it's disappointing, uh, but we'll see if <laughs> we'll see if they can somehow piece together um, some uh, a string of wins down the stretch against some really good opponents. The Pac-12, though they're considered to be kind of on the lower tier of men's college basketball, uh, they're still so they still have a lot of talent in that league, and uh, you know Utah's just got to figure out a way to catch back up to that. Uh, now, speaking about Utah State and BYU, and I, I have to completely agree with Dan that I think BYU. Uh, or Mike, excuse me, that I'd have to completely agree with him that BYU does have the best chance of being able to make it from the state of Utah. But Utah State has been playing awesome up in Logan. Uh, you know, I think they do have an opportunity of being able to win the Mountain West and uh, and be a team that that uh, that represents the state of Utah. But if I had to give one and one only, I'm giving it to BYU, even though BYU every single season has a loss like they did earlier this week to Pepperdine. They seem to have those losses every single year. And if you're a BYU fan, that's gotta be frustrating. I'm sure it is. You know, I'll say this though about Utah state. Like if there's one guy in the state who's figured out how to work March, it's Craig Smith. He's gone two for two in conference tournaments already in his tenure as head coach up at Utah state. So I like the Aggies a lot. I just want to put that out there. Let's move on to our final quarter though. We're a week out or so from the big game, the Super Bowl. Uh, you know, it's going to be a big contest. We talked about this this week on Facer to Facer, our little back and forth uh, written feature this week, uh, young versus old, Tom Brady versus Patrick Mahomes. What's your take uh, from the guy who's uh, kind of near my dad's age, Mike? Yes, I'm uh, almost as old as Dirk. You're right about that. Um, <laughs> I think uh, – it's going to be a fun matchup, you know, uh, with Tom, with probably the, the best quarterback of all time against, I think, the current best quarterback in Patrick Mahomes, Brady against Mahomes. So that's going to be a lot of fun to see that. I was kind of hoping, though, for a, uh, a Kansas City. I'm not a big Green Bay fan, but I was kind of hoping to see Green Bay, Kansas City, because that was, uh, those of you, got, you guys aren't old enough to remember this, but that was the first Super Bowl ever back in the, when, when Dirk was a baby, 1967. And I, I remember that game very well. Green Bay won it pretty easily, and I was rooting for Kansas City back then. But uh, that would have been kind of fun to see a, a rematch of that, you know, 50 some odd years later, just to, to see what, to see that same matchup. But um, back then, in fact, just here's a here's a trivia for you. That it was not called the Super Bowl back then. It was called the, uh, I wish I knew the, the the championship game or something. They, it was Super Bowl the next year or the year after they started calling it the Super Bowl. So. But anyway, um, I just, uh, it's going to be a fun game. And my only, I, I kind of want Kansas City to win just because uh, I, I get tired of Brady always winning these big games. And I'm also kind of mad at Tampa Bay for uh, getting rid of our boy Matt Gay this year. You know, uh, Dirk and I were up there last year in Seattle and I got to interview Matt Gay and he was, ex you know, excited about his future. And all of a sudden they cut him this year and now he's doing well with the Rams. But uh, so for that reason, I kind of uh, am rooting against the, the Buccaneers and hoping that. Kansas City wins again. Tyson, what do you think? What are your thoughts on Super Bowl? You're a young fella, so you're probably a Patrick Mahomes guy. <laughs> I love Patrick Mahomes. It's so, it, it, it's so fun to see how he is similar to a Steph Curry in the NFL. I mean, he kind of looks like him, first of all, but he, is, right. he, is, he has changed the game the way that Steph Curry changed the game as well, and he's just made it fun. Uh, but I, I, I really like where, uh, what Kansas City's doing, and that's the reason why I accidentally just called Mike Dan is because they have Dan Sorensen on their team as well uh, on the defensive end. That it's it's they're just a fun team. I, and I'm a huge Andy Reed fan. I love Andy Reed. And, uh, and I, even though I'm one of those guys that doesn't like to see repeat championship, uh, a repeat Super Bowl champions, I'm all about these guys taking it. I'm an Atlanta Falcons fan. So I don't want to see the Tampa Bay Buccaneers win it. So that's, that's my thought. <laughs> you also are uh, harboring a bit of uh, angst and uh, anger after what happened in the Super Bowl a few years ago when uh, Brady led that comeback over the Falcons, right? I think I tease you about that every week for like, a, for like a full 18 months. So oh, that was horrible. Absolutely horrible. The absolute highs of 
thinking you're going to win the Super Bowl at halftime, being up so uh, – I can't remember the exact score, but obviously 28 to 3. Yeah, so, uh, it was 28 to 3 late in the third quarter, and you just – you know, those highs of being like, ah, my team's going to do it. And then, obviously, we all know what happened. Well, Tom Brady did that to our Seahawks one year. Kind of, well, it was the defense, really, but still – that thought of, you know, the picture of Tom Brady pumping his fist when the interception of Russell Wilson at the end of the game. It hurts, yeah. Just give the ball to the beast mode and yeah. let's win this thing and be done with it. But, you know, I know your pain, mm-hmm. but 28-3 is a tough one. That's a, oh. that's a tough one. That's a killer. Uh, guys, any other thoughts on the Super Bowl? Um, I'm, I'm just, just excited uh, for it. Like, uh, so, oh, sorry, Mike, go ahead. No, I'm just going to say it should be a fun day, and I just uh, hope that uh, we see a great quarterback battle that day. Hey, so what's your thoughts? I'm, I'm just – I love Super Bowl Sunday. It's, it's one of my favorite days of the year. Uh, it gives me an opportunity to kind of gather around with my family and just eat a bunch of snack food and junk food and, uh, you know, try to get fat, but also enjoy some good football. So, you know, I'm hoping it's a good game. Um, obviously, like I said, I'd like to see Kansas City win, but I just hope it's a competitive game. I had my daughter already roll her eyes. She told me the weekend, some guy named the weekend is the halftime show. And I said, that's his name, the weekend. So I'm, I'm old school, but uh, anyway, the halftime show and the commercials, I guess are going to be a little different this year too. No Budweiser, Pepsi or Coca-Cola. I don't think so. Yeah, it should be different. Does that mean that the Budweiser, the Pepsi and the Coke will be cheaper at the stores? I don't think so. No. (laughs) anyway well guys uh, appreciate you joining us we're now to our favorite segment because it's the last segment the parting shots uh mike what's your parting shots this week well you know i'd like to give a shout out to gary anderson you know the former utah state football coach you know who my longtime colleague doug robinson wrote about in the uh in some paper this week i guess we can't mention that name <laughs> but anyway um the, he's a, the former Cottonwood High and Utah lineman was, uh, he kind of got a bad reputation and probably deservedly so for, uh, you know, he kind of gave up on every head coaching job he ever had. We left Southern Utah after one year, he left Utah State after three or four years, he left Wisconsin after two years, he left with Oregon State in the middle of the season, and, uh, and then he got fired at Utah State. But, you know, like every other coach in the world, you know, he was entitled to uh, accept, you know, he to accept a certain amount of money, you know, after he lost his job, but unlike every other coach to roll, he's declining to take the money. Um, he has $2.7 million on the table. Utah state owes him because they fired him. And he says, he's not going to take it because he doesn't deserve it because he doesn't earn it. He gave up about $12 million up at Oregon state for the same reason. And so he, that's $15 million that he's left on the table that that would, uh, take care of a lot of trips to Europe and maybe he could buy him a new Maserati or something. But uh, another cool part of that story is the fact that he's, uh, he's declining to uh, give any formal interview about it. He just uh, texted a couple lines to Doug about it. And uh, so in other words, he's not making a big deal about it and saying, you know, um, tooting his own horn saying, look at me, look what I'm doing. So I just like to give kudos to Gary, you know, who we all know, you know, Dirk and I know very well from our time, his time at Utah for showing integrity and uh, humility in a profession that often lacks both. Yeah, you know, I was going to say a couple of years ago when he uh, left Oregon State and ended up on the Utah staff, um, I did a story on him, and he did not want to discuss the Oregon State situation. And, and to his credit, I mean, that's something a lot of guys would get a lot of praise for, leaving that much money on the table. And he didn't want any part of it. He just wants to move on, and uh, it sounds like he's doing the same again. Uh, Tyson, what are your, what's your parting shot this week? So I want to give a shout out to Joe Ingles. Uh, Dang it. Guy, that was mine. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> so you should have gone first. I'll you think gone of something else. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> uh, but Joe Ingles broke the all-time three-point record uh, for, the, uh, for, for the Utah Jazz yesterday. He passed John Stockton. Stockton had 845 three-pointers made. Joe Ingles in just eight seasons since 2014. 13? Oh my gosh, I can't remember the exact year, but he has, uh, he's, he's already surpassed John Stockton for the most three-pointers in Utah Jazz history, uh, and 
he did it in such a great way to knock down a, two straight three pointers when he only had one more to go to tie. And uh, what's really cool about that is he did it in 134 less three point attempts than John Stockton. When you think about Stockton, you just think about how good of a shooter he actually was and how we all say that he should have shot it more when he was with the jazz, but um, Joe Ingles doing it in 134 less three point attempts. Uh, and then also just uh, what the jazz are doing from the three point line this year. Uh, I mean, just, obviously they're shooting lights out from beyond the arc. Uh, if the season were to end today, or if it would have ended last night after their win against uh, Dallas, they would be the, uh, they would be tied with the 73 win warriors back in 2015, 16 uh, for sixth most 20 plus three point games already. So uh, shout out to the Utah jazz, shout out to Joe Ingles. That's great. You know, I I'm old school. I think of the golden Griff, Daryl Griffith, when he'd shoot three pointers, but it seemed like, I don't know, Mike, he shot three or four a game, and we'd think it was a big deal that he tried that many threes. And He never yeah. got to 100 in a season, yes. No. <laughs> but, you know, he's kind of remembered for, you know, after his dunking ability sort of uh, went by the wayside with age, he became a three-point shooter. And really, compared to these guys now, he wasn't a three-point shooter either, was he? Just no. a guy who shot long shots. So, um, us, let's see what you scrambled and came up with. For your yeah, um, I was just trying to think of commonalities between Tyson and myself. So I just want to use my time to give a shout out to uh, David Locke, who hired both of us uh, back in 2014, I think, to be his broadcast assistants. Uh, that's where Tyson and I met. Um, so uh, that was a great time for both of us. And uh, David's company, the Lockdown Podcast Network, uh, just closed a big deal. And they were uh, purchased by a media company called Tegna um, on the, out on the East Coast. So Kudos to David. Congrats to him. So, too bad he didn't include this in the big cash grab. Yeah. We could have <laughs> made a few bucks, but we'll uh, get there. Get there. My parting shot is uh, to former Utah quarterback Brian Johnson. Uh, he made history, becoming the first uh, black uh, offensive coordinator in the SEC, and now he's jumping to the NFL. And and he was a guy that didn't get much of a sniff, uh, despite leading Utah to the Sugar Bowl championship as far as um, playing in the NFL and now he gets to go there and coach and make a few bucks so I wish him well and uh, guys uh, once again thank you for joining us so turn it back over to Austin yeah thanks again guys um, so you can get this podcast anywhere uh, pretty much Apple Spotify all those places make sure to follow us on social media Twitter Instagram Facebook all that uh, we do have the newsletter, like we mentioned last week, and we're giving away Good some fabulous coach. prizes. Uh, we loaded up on the clearance rack at at, uh, at fans, so we got some good stuff to give away. So, uh, you know, we encourage people to sign up. Um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll see how that giveaway goes. Follow follow us on social media for more info on that. But anyway, thanks again, guys. We really appreciate your time. Have a safe yeah. week. See ya.